A very good afternoon to all present. Uh, today's webinar topic is radio frequency ablation. It's one of the advanced pain intervention procedures, which is being carried out quite uh, commonly all across the globe. And uh, expertise in radio frequency ablation is of paramount importance for any, any pain uh, interventional specialist. I am Dr. Khaja Javed Khan and uh, consultant uh, pain specialist. And I would be doing this following topic under the following headings. I'll be talking about introduction, followed by what is radio frequency ablation, talking a little bit about the physics of thermocoagulation, differentiating between conventional and pulsed radio frequency ablation techniques, talking about the cool radio frequency ablation, the newer alternative at our disposal, the various applications, followed by finally the conclusion. Starting off with the introduction, the use of radio frequency in pain management dates way back to 1965, where it was used for the treatment of unilateral pain in cancer patients for the management of unilateral pain by doing percutaneous lateral cordotomy. Few, late, few, few years down the line, <coughs> radio frequency treatment of Gesserin ganglion was described. The first use of RFA for spinal pain was described by Shealy, where there was radio frequency ablation of lumbar facet joints, which was done. Let's have a look at the history timeline. In the 1920s, Cushing did a series of experiments to show utility of the RF technique. In the 30s, Kirshner used high frequency lesions of Gasserian ganglion for trigeminal neuralgia. In the 50s, Hansberger and Wiss proposed high frequency alternating current for the first time. In 1950s, Kosman and Arnoff produced first commercially available radio frequency generator. In 1975, first application for spinal pain by Shealy was done. In the 1980s, Sloija delivered percutaneous RFA techniques for cervical, lumbar, thoracic, and sacral discogenic pain syndromes. In 1994, Sloija developed pulsed radio frequency mode. Now, coming to what exactly is radio frequency ablation? It's a non-surgical, minimally invasive procedure that utilizes heat energy to reduce or stop the pain transmission. These radio frequency waves ablate or burn the nerve that is causing the pain, essentially by eliminating the transmission of pain signals to the brain. What is the principle of radio frequency current? A high frequency current of 500 kilohertz produced by the generator on the neural tissue through a closed circuit will lead to neurolysis of the nerves. When a high frequency of AC current is passed, to and fro movements of the charge ions occur. This leads to generation of heat due to the electromagnetic friction. Let's have a look at a bit of physics of thermocoagulation. Well, what are the components of a basic radio frequency circuit? The following, which is radio frequency generator machine, the active electrode, the cables, and the ground pad. This over here, we are seeing, this is the radio frequency RF generator, the cables, RFA cables, and the ground pads. This is how a closed circuit looks like. We have the RF generator, the dispersive pad, the RFA probe resulting in the lesion, and all of this form a circuit. So high frequency, low energy current builds electromagnetic field between electrodes. Here, free charged ions move back and forth to cause oscillation and collision, resulting in friction. This friction raises temperature in the tissues, which is sensed by active tip of the electrode. Here, what you're seeing is, this is a generator. Starting the circuit over here, this is a probe. The lesion is happening. This is the pad, which is connected to the ground. Now, let's have a look at the active electrode or the cannula. 
different sizes are available 5 10 15 centimeters etc either they are disposable or reusable the exposed tip is the most important thing it is the one which delivers the radio frequency current now what are the variables of a radio frequency cannula they are namely the total length of the cannula the length of the exposed tip portion the type of tip curved or straight and the sharpness whether sharp or blunt here if you see there are two figures <clears throat> on the left hand side you can see these are the conventional radio frequency probes and on the right we have the cool radio frequency probe moving ahead let's have a look at the lesion the shape resembles an inverted cone the size and consistency depend on a lot of factors namely the electrode tip configuration temperature local tissue characteristics that is impedance now what is impedance impedance is nothing but the resistance offered by that particular tissue where the probe is in contact with the rate of thermal equilibrium and time so here we are seeing that length of the tip and the lesion diameter and length are very important for the characteristics of the lesion. Well, let's move ahead to the impedance. As I said before, impedance is nothing but the resistance offered by the particular tissue. So, for example, if the electrode is close to the CSF, which is a liquid medium, so there is going to be low impedance. Now, proximity of a large blood vessel to the electrode tip would deviate the energy. If there is a high resistance structure, like the bone, it can present a very high impedance path. Now, moving ahead, let's have a look at what is the difference between conventional and pulsed RF. Conventional RF, it's a heat producing lesion. Pulsed RFA, here the electric field is the one producing the lesion. The most important point is the temperature. In conventional, temperature can go up to 85 degrees Celsius, but as in pulsed, the temperature is not raised beyond 42 degrees Celsius. What you're seeing over here is in pulsed RF, the temperature is not being raised beyond 42. What you have to always keep in mind is for any nerve related damage to occur, the temperature has to be above 45 degrees Celsius. So in pulsed RFA, if you see, there is no heat lesion which is happening. This is more of a neuromodulation which is happening because the temperature is static and not raised beyond 42 degree Celsius. Similarly, the pain-free period also varies for the type of the nerve. Usually, it is more than one year in the conventional RFA on an average. Comparatively, the pulsed RFA duration is usually short. Now, let's move ahead and have a look at the cool radio frequency ablation. So, cool RF, here the temperature used to ablate the desired tissue is less when compared to conventional radio frequency ablation. The volume of tissue heated and the resultant thermal lesion size is substantially larger with the, con with the cool radio frequency ablation as compared to the conventional radio frequency ablation. Let's have a look at the principle. In contrast to conventional RF, where the target is heated to 80 degrees for 90 seconds on an average, the cooled RFA uses constant flow of ambient water circulated through the electrode via peristaltic pump to maintain a lower tissue temperature by creating a heat sink, but still allowing neurolysis to occur. By removing heat from tissues immediately adjacent to the electrode tip, a lower lesioning temperature is maintained, resulting in less tissue charring adjacent to the electrode and therefore less tissue impedance. Here you are seeing a comparison, a geometric comparison of the lesions between the conventional and the cooled RFA. If you see, conventional is more of an oval lesion, whereas with cooled, it's a spherical lesion. Now, both, both conventional and cooled work through ionic heating. 
wherein there is friction of the charged molecules resulting in heat formation which helps in thermally ablation and deactivation of the nerves now what are the challenges with a conventional or a standard rf they can be variabilities in the neural structures for example here you are seeing the knee genicular lesion so there is quite a bit of a variability so lesions created by standard rf are often unable to capture all target nerves in one single attempt therefore we have to do multiple lesions when we are doing a conventional rf now in a conventional rf ionic heating is greatest at the probe and tissue interface since lesion occurs only within the area immediately adjacent to the probe active tip the lesion distally projects at only a minimal distance beyond the tip resulting in an elliptical lesion so here you are seeing the different temperatures greatest is close to the tip 80 degrees as you go farther away it is lesser 65 and 40 diameter in the conventional rf is 4 mm the lesion diameter therefore because of the shape size and lack of distal projection standard rf lesions are too small to reach your targeted nerves yes, if you compare between standard and cooled rf the standard rf has a smaller volume whereas cooled rf there is a larger volume minimal distance projection in standard rf greater distal projection in cooled rf no angle independence whereas cooled rf enables angle independence let's have a look at the how the cooled rf probe looks like this is how it looks so this is basically a water cool probe the moving fluid acts as a heat sink removing heat away from where the tip and tissue interface is lying but delivering rf energy through water cooled electrodes greater rf energy can be safely transmitted to nervous tissues so here you are see this is a how a lesion of cooled rf looks like now first point is the lesion volume is five times larger than conventional rf there is 45% distal projection or greater and there is angle independence now compare the lesions it is almost three times three to four times of a standard rf now moving ahead let's have a look of the applications of the rf in our standard day to day practice coming to the knee joint the knee is innervated by articular branches called the genicular nerves of various major nerves like femoral tibial common peroneal or fibular saphenous and obturator nerves the articular branches follow the genicular vessels <laughs> what are the targets we have the genicular nerves superior medial superior lateral inferior medial optional suprapatellar genicular nerve can also be done as a fourth lesion <laughs> now this is how a fluoroscopy garrett technique looks like in a patient with osteoarthritis initially we all used to do the fluoroscopy garrett technique for the needle frequency ablations these are the ap view targets what you are seeing here yes so here what you are seeing is you are seeing the ap view targets in fluoroscopic guided technique the important thing over here what we have to see is that this is for the superior medial superior lateral and the inferior medial now the important thing what used to happen over here is that you know whenever we were using the fluoroscopic guided technique what used to happen is the needle had to scratch the bone and go so if you're seeing over here in this part the needle is almost scratching the bone here as well right so this used to result in a lot of pain for the patient which made the thing very uncomfortable especially with the fluoroscopic guided 
technique. If you look at the targets, what were the various targets? The targets were junction between the shaft and the condyle, be it the femur or the tibia. Clear? Let's move ahead. Okay. Now, the important thing over here is that in the lateral view, lateral view, what was important is that the needles have to be in the middle of the shaft, right? So what we had to do is we had to maintain the needles in contact with the bone. So what is for the happening is it was resulting in a lot of pain for the patients. So here is a video of how the fluoroscopic guided technique works. So here you are seeing the genicular RF of the knee. This is a cool unit frequency technique. If you're seeing, this is the knee joint. We see the various now, superior medial, superior medial, superior lateral, and then the inferior medial genicular nerves, right? So these are the various targets, right? Now, on the lateral view, this is how it is there. And you have to ensure that the needle is in the middle, as you're seeing in the both the diagrams. Now, what I had started off first by doing the fluoroscopic correct technique only. But again, there was always the feeling that there's a lot of discomfort for the patient. So I shifted off to the ultrasound guided technique. Advantage of the ultrasound guided technique is that, you know, you don't need to be in contact with the periosteum. So the pain is far lesser for the patient. Now here you are seeing the ultrasound guided technique. Let me just play this particular video over here, right? And what you're seeing over here is, one second, let me just pause it, oh, sorry. Let's pause this, I'll just annotate it over here, if you're seeing now. Yeah. So this is the area of the vessel. Hmm? This is the needle and this is the artery or the vessel. Let me play the video again for you. Yeah. Sorry. There, you can see the vessel over there and then that is the needle, right? Okay. Let's just get rid of this. All right, let's move ahead. So what are the advantages of uh, doing knee neurotomy with ultrasound? Of course, there's no radiation. It is real time guidance soft tissue visualization possible, so we can remove if there's any effusion as well. Doctor helps in uh, genicular nerve visualization. Now let's have a look at a bit of literature over here. So this is a, was a systematic review and meta-analysis of 12 RCTs evaluating the efficacy of RFA treatment for knee pain. And what they inferred is that cooled RFA or a conventional RF on genicular nerve exhibited a most significant and long lasting analgesic effect compared to the intra articular pulsed RF. Now, let's move ahead to the hip joint RFA. So, the hip joint we all know is a ball and socket joint formed by articulation between the pelvic estabulum and the head of the femur. Innovation of the joint is quite complex. Specifically, anteromural innovation is separated by branches of the obturator nerve. Whereas anterior portion of the joint capsule is by articular branches of the femoral nerve. 
Posterior hip innervation is by branches of sciatic nerve. Groin hip pain is thought, has been thought to be generated by articular branches of the operator nerve, while lateral or trochanteric pain is carried by femoral articular branches. What are the targets? We have the femoral nerve articular branches and the operator nerve articular branches, and these are going to be the two targets. <laughs> Now, this you are seeing over here is a fluoroscopic guided technique. And if you see, this is the target of the femoral articular branches. And this is the target for the operator articular branches. So I prefer using a hybrid technique wherein I use the ultrasound as well, mainly to be careful to not injure any of the major vessels. Especially when you're doing the operator nerve lesion, then there's a high chance that the vessels can come in the way. So be very careful because these are major vessels. And especially if you're doing cool RFA, the needles are quite fat and bigger. It can result in artery or venous blowouts. So here you see my patient, I'm doing the hip cool RFA. This is the target for the femoral branches. This is for the operator branches. Now, if you have a look at the literature, combining fluoroscopy with ultrasound and multiple stack lesions, bipolar ablation of cold RF may increase the likelihood of successful ablation of the nociceptive nerve subject to the hip joint. This was by a review article, an evidence-based narrative review, by where radiofrequency procedures to relieve chronic hip pain were uh, studied. <laughs> They concluded that RF treatment for sensory innovation of hip joint had the potential to reduce pain secondary to degenerative conditions. <clears throat> Let's move ahead. Sacroiliac joint now. This sacroiliac joint is the largest axial joint in the body, formed between sacrum and iliac bones on either sides. Posterior SI joint is innervated by L5 to S3 posterior primary rami and anterior joint by L2 to S2 rami. It has dense innervations and very difficult to block individual nerves. The RFA of sacral leg joint is popularly referred to as carpet bombing, wherein we have to try to destroy as much of the nervous tissues as possible. And remember, you are only destroying the posterior part. Anterior part, you cannot do much of <clears throat> any ablation. So this joint which is the largest axial joint of the body, has dense nervous innovations. So what are the innovations? Again, we are seeing over here. We have the L4, the L5, S1, S2, lateral branches, S3 also occasionally. So this is me doing the SI cold RF. As you see, this one I'm placing the needle around the S1 for R. So what are the various targets as you are seeing over here? We are targeting the L4 middle branch, L5 medial branch, or the L5 dorsal ramus, S1, S2, S3. So these are all like you're seeing, you know, chunked up lesions around the SI joint. Okay, so this is the uh, video for sacral leg joint denervation, what we are seeing. So here, as you are seeing, densely innovated, we have the various targets over here, sacral ala. This is the L5 dorsal ramus target. L4 also above can also be done. S1, S2, and S3 are also there. And that's for the L5 dorsal ramus, the target. Let's have a look at the other targets as well for the sacral joint. This goes to the foramen. Again, three lesions over there, right? Here there's one. And then, as you see, one, two, and three uh, with the cool RFA needle, usually spaced uh, a few millimeters close to each other. And this is the right side. So if I, if you're seeing over here, this are two o'clock, four o'clock, and those o'clock positions. This is around the S2 foramen, right? You're seeing the lesions, S2, three lesions around the S2 foramen. Yes, the third lesion around the S2 foramen. 
then moving ahead to the S3. S3, around two lesions are <coughs> commonly done. One and the second. So what you're seeing over here is lot of lesions, right? Around the sacroiliac joint. Right, so let's have a look at a bit of literature regarding the role of RF ablation for SI joint pain. <clears throat> Meta-analysis demonstrated that RFA is an effective treatment for SI joint pain at three months and six months. Right, so moving ahead, uh, let's have a look at shoulder joint radiofrequency ablation. A bit rare, not commonly done though, but we need to know about this as well. <clears throat> Now, now remember the shoulder consists of a, it's a, it's a basically a ball and socket joint formed by articulation of humerus, scapula, and the surrounding structures, ligaments, muscles, and tendons, which support the bones and maintain relationship of one another. The nerve supply is by axillary, suprascapular, and the lateral pectoral nerves. What are the targets now? Articular branches of axillary, suprascapular, and lateral pectoral nerves. These are going to be the targets. Let's have a look at the targets. Now, I annotate uh, this a bit. So basically, on the left side of your screen, what you are seeing is the, here we are doing the lesion for the articular branches of the lateral pectoral nerves. Whereas on the right side, it is for the articular branches, the suprascapular and the axillary nerves. Let's have a look at uh, the uh, video. I had done this uh, shoulder video observation recently. So here, yes, we had a patient with us who was suffering from severe uh, arthritis. You can see the X-ray over here. This is uh, the shoulder joint wherein there is severe osteoarthritis of the shoulder. The patient was advised surgery, but the patient uh, didn't want to undergo surgery. So we plan to do the radio frequency ablation of the shoulder joint. And uh, after a positive diagnostic block before, the patient had more than 75% uh, of pain relief. And we decided to go ahead with the shoulder full radio frequency ablation. After painting, and raping the this you are seeing the cool RFA probe. And this was, mind you, an ultra, a uh, whole ultrasound garret technique because the patient could not lie down prone. Yes, the patient could not lie down prone. So that's why we had to do this in, uh, with the patient in lateral position. So here first, I'm starting off by locating at the target for the articular branches of the suprascapular nerve. Phenoclinoid notch is what we are looking at a target over here. And then lateral to it, we are going to find the articular branches. So here I'm going almost out of uh, plane technique is being utilized over here. Remember the RFA needles are bigger. So we have to use a tracking needle. And then after proper stimulation, we are going to do the lesion. So this is, you're seeing the lesion happening. <coughs> Giving some local before doing the lesion. There you are seeing, this is how, this is a cooled RFA machine. The lesion in progress, going on. This is a graph wherein you're seeing. Remember the cooled RFA, it's going to be a time duration of two and a half minutes and the temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Moving ahead, now we'll have to, we are targeting the axillary branches. Articular branches of the axillary nerve. 
there you see we are doing the lesion for that so this shoulder rfa usually the technique is done wherein you have to keep the patient in two positions one is supine and one is prone prone you are going to lesion the articular branches of suprascapular and the axillary nerve and spine the lateral pectoral nerves now we are preparing to do for the lateral pectoral nerves right so here the target we are going to target the coracoid process <laughs> There, we are going in plane and then we are going to target in the upper part of the coracoid process. Remember, this is a very superficial area, so you have to be very careful about skin burns, especially in emaciated patients. So giving some local, we will be starting with the lesion. And that was about the shoulder uh, cool frequency ablation. Let's have a look at a bit of literature. Systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, RFA procedures on shoulder joint innovation concluded by telling that RFA treatments targeting the sensitive innovation of the shoulder joint affected by degenerative conditions have the potential to reduce pain, but still a lot more studies are warranted. As I said, the shoulder RFA procedures are not very common. Lastly, let's have a look at the facet joint. Now, the facet joints are formed by articulation between inferior articular process of the above vertebra with the superior articular process of the below vertebra. Each facet joint receives, receives innovation from medial branch of the dorsal rami of the nerve at the same level and one level above. The medial branch of the dorsal rami gives motor supply to the multifidus muscle. Now, let's have a look at the targets. In this picture, I think you would be able to appreciate a Scotty dog, just delineated in red. Remember, the target point is junction of the superior articular process and transverse process at the eye of the Scotty dog. For alpha S1 facet, target the posterior primary rami of alpha, which is in the groove at junction of superior articular process of the sacral ala. And here you are seeing cool RFA is being done on the facet. This is the Scotty dog view, wherein you are going close to reach the junction of SAP and transverse process near the eye of the Scotty dog. And in the lateral view, you have to stay on the bone and not go anywhere close to the foramen. Let's have a look at the video. So this is for lumbar middle branch, lumbar facet, neurotomy, what video we are going to see. So if you see over here, this is the AP view, the superior arterial process and transverse process, right? That's going to be the target, right? Yes. So you're seeing the neural foramen, so stay on the bone and do not go anywhere closer to the neural foramen. Having a look at a bit of literature, a comparison, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis where they told the efficacy of cooled RF was the most effective for treating lumbar facet joint pain. Conventional RF came second and pulsed RF was least effective. And this was a follow-up visit at six months. Well, let's have a look at a few complications with the RFA. They include bleeding, nerve injury, infection, neuritis, soft tissue injuries, and allergic reactions. Finally, to conclude, I'd say that RF ablation is a minimally invasive option for providing long-term pain relief, improving quality of life in chronic pain patients. Judicious patient selection is of paramount importance. A safe and efficacious technique is what is the radio frequency ablation. But remember, it does have a steep learning curve. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I hereby conclude my presentation.